is a particular privilege for me to be with you today because uh, we share something. Uh, and I've chatted with a number of you uh, over the course of the last hour or so. And uh, it occurs to me that all of us, all of us, each in his or her own way, is in the empowerment business. And um, it's lucky that we are. Uh, I needn't tell anyone in this room that the social challenges uh, that our society faces are deeper, tougher, more demanding, more unrelenting than ever before. Yet, at the same time, uh, philanthropy isn't what it once was. It certainly is inadequate to the task in and of itself, a uh, significant part, but only a part. And governments, too, sadly, can't be counted on. I uh, saw here in Texas that your budget deficit is in the billions, as is ours in Illinois. Uh, we beat you. Ours is bigger than yours. Uh, not something I'm particularly proud of, but it's true. And uh, at the federal level, too, obviously, the, the budget debate goes on without any uh, likely resolution in sight that's going to make things materially better. Uh, in the foreseeable future. So increasingly, those of us in the social sector are relying upon ourselves. And we are seeking ways to attract private capital to ventures that, one, generate revenue, two, uh, drive positive social change or ameliorate a social problem. And that's what social enterprise is all about. So the trick is, what are the means by which private sector capital can be enticed to invest in social purpose businesses and nonprofits, uh, given that the economic value proposition is often unsatisfactory. The risk is greater than the reward, and often, private sector investors are less concerned about social return than many of us are. So how do we catalyze private sector investment under those circumstances? And that's really what today's talk is going to be largely about. There are three different categories of investments where capital is deployed for both financial and social returns. I'm going to talk a little bit about each of them, and then I'm going to show you some strategies that actually dig deep and drive investment of these categories. So socially responsible and mission-related investing, impact investing, and you've probably been hearing lots about that of late, and program-related investing, which boils down to a tax concept. Socially responsible and mission-related investing is something that I am uh, particularly passionate about. Uh, I wrote a book on that subject too, which was published in 2005 by Institutional Investor out of London. Um, and it encourages the alignment of an individual's or institution's portfolio with the values or mission of that investor in a way that will reflect values, core beliefs, in a way that does not result in uh, give up in terms of financial returns. But historically, socially responsible investing or mission-related investing depends on screening, and most of the time it's negative screening. That is, don't invest in tobacco or alcohol or munitions, whatever the controversial industry. The uh, tweak to that concept, uh, for which I claim some credits, is positive screening where you look at the behaviors of managers of companies in areas surrounding social justice or respect for the environment. And you do this in a very granular fashion and ensure that the portfolios in which you're investing uh, are uh, exclusively companies whose management behaviors you are comfortable embracing and supporting. And uh, to the extent there's any shortfall, the portfolio strategy itself can improve managerial behavior in those areas. So screening is one of the um, primary drivers of 
what's called socially responsible investing, or in my parlance, it's advocacy investing. Um, and if you're interested in that, I'll give you a slight plug, one of probably several. Uh, take a look at advocacyinvesting.com, which is our website on this, on this very subject. Um, but this relates to traditional investments, stocks and bonds and the like, and converting a passive asset into an active one that actually makes things happen in addition to delivering the cash flow, the appreciation that the investor is seeking. Socially responsible investing also includes shareholder advocacy, um, voting of proxies, um, initiating shareholder referenda or proposals, again, to improve social and environmental decisions by boards and officers of public companies. And then finally, socially responsible investing includes high impact community investing. So CRI type investments by financial institutions, for example. So that's one piece of the puzzle, socially responsible investments. The second is impact investing. And uh, this is something where uh, Rockefeller, uh, JP Morgan Chase and others are uh, pushing the notion that uh, one can invest in companies whose activities themselves impact social or environmental conditions in a salutary way. And the intent here is to complement philanthropy and government support, both of which, as we've already understood, can't do the job. So this now becomes the third leg to that stool. We'll talk about that, too, in some specificity. And then program-related investing, which brings us to the core foundation of the L3C, the Low Profit Limited Liability Company. Uh, I drafted much of this legislation around the country, and uh, as you'll see, this is a, 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 a capital formation tool for the social <coughs> sector that will depend heavily upon program-related investing. So let's talk about what that means. Uh, I got to give you a little tax law here. I hate to do it when it's 103 degrees. Uh, I promise I'll make this as painless as I can. Um, and to make matters worse, not only is it tax law, but it's ancient tax law. Um, up until 1969, foundations, private foundations, were being created all over the country, as they are today, usually in anticipation of a liquidity event. A small business is going to be sold, and the entrepreneur who developed that business is told, well, you know, if you set up a foundation and dump some of your shares in your company in that foundation, and the foundation now sells the shares, to that extent, the proceeds will escape capital gain tax. Yep. And from that point forward, you can use this foundation as a piggy bank to pay the charitable donations that you otherwise have been paying personally to your church, symphony, opera, cancer society, whatever you may have been doing, this now becomes the vehicle to fund those expenses. And you will have, uh, you will have amassed significant capital free of tax, and that capital will continue to grow tax exempt. So interest, dividends, capital gains will also escape taxation. The public policy reason behind that tax opportunity was that the foundation was required to fund charitable causes, <coughs> yet most didn't. And up until 1969, there was no legal requirement that any specific dollar amount or percentage of corpus be dedicated to charitable purposes. Interestingly, many foundations grew very wealthy, never having favored a charity. Some of them accumulated shares of public companies, ultimately controlling public companies. This was the 20th century version of the robber baron, using tax subsidies 
to build personal wealth. So Congress in 1969 said, enough. As part of the Tax Reform Act of 1969, Congress mandated, and this still continues to be the law, that every foundation to preserve its tax benefits must distribute at least 5% of its assets annually for charitable purposes. This is an approximation of the yield, the return on the portfolio. So the idea is, okay, hold your principal, but any earnings you make, let's kick them out for charitable purposes, because that's the reason we gave you the tax benefits. This distribution obligation is what accounts for the feverish competition for grants among charities. And we can commiserate about whether or not that is a warranted distraction from mission when charities are spending lots of time chasing grant money. But what is less understood is that the very same law provided an alternative means of satisfying the 5% distribution requirements. And that is the program related investment. So today, as 40 years ago, foundations were obliged to distribute 5% a year, but can, could, will be able to do that either by granting, investing, or some combination of the two, so long as it adds up to at least 5% of the assets of the foundation. Now, one would assume that if a foundation or anybody is given a choice of incurring an expense or making an investment, one would prefer to make an investment. Why? An expense, you write a check, it goes into a charity, you keep your fingers crossed, hope for the best, but the money's gone, you will never see it again. A foundation, on the other hand, has the ability to make an investment debt, equity, or anything in between, again, for charitable purposes, that investment continues on as an asset on the foundation's balance sheet, hopefully to be recovered, hopefully with earnings. And as that money comes back, it can be recycled for charitable purposes over and over and over again. So you have a financial multiplier effect when you have an investment that you don't have when you have a grant. And you have a social multiplier effect in an investment that you don't have when you have a grant. Any questions about that? That's purely an accounting pattern. Now, program-related investments, those that qualify to count against the 5% distribution are a special kind of investment. It has to meet specific tests imposed by federal tax law to qualify. Otherwise, you're bound by the prudent person rule that says the foundation's managers must be good stewards of the resources entrusted to them and therefore must invest in a diversified way conservatively, with reasonable returns, reasonable security. PRI isn't that at all. In fact, it's the opposite. Usually, if the manager of a foundation makes an investment that is speculative for less than fair market return, without adequate security, the foundation and the manager can both be held accountable for having jeopardized the investments of the foundation. And an excise tax will attach. Program-related investments are an exception. Here, the law requires that the investment be high risk and speculative because the money is to use to fund a gap where private sector investments is not attracted to funding charitable 
ventures because it's not going to make a lot of money, it may be a proof of concept deal, it may be a capacity building situation. So since the private sector doesn't find this attractive financially, the social sector has no place else to go but back to the foundation and the government affords the foundation this opportunity to write a check, to fund a charitable purpose, speculatively, low return or no return, can have a zero coupon bond, as long as the tests are met. And what are the tests? Here they are. The primary purpose has to be charitable. By that, we're talking about the expansive 501c3 definition of charity, which is recited here. Income production can't be the reason this is being done. It can only be incidental. Because if the thing was going to generate a lot of income, don't use tax subsidized money from the foundation. Go get private sector players. Get socially conscious individuals. Get institutional investors. Get the banks to loan you money. Similarly, it can't be gotten into for the purpose of appreciating an asset. Again, if you're getting into something with a reasonable expectation that this uh, value of the business is going to grow significantly, go, go sell some securities to some private investor. Don't rely on government subsidized money. And following the 501c3 restrictions on lobbying and the support or opposition of candidates, same rules apply within the PRI. PRI money cannot be used to give a competitive advantage to one candidate or platform over another. So here we have a high-risk investment that's going to be carved out from the rules that would otherwise penalize foundations for managing money speculatively, where the charitable purpose is driving the decision to invest, and yet there's no great expectation of making a lot of money. So let's see what opportunity that presents. PRIs can be structured in lots of different ways. They can be loans, and if they're loans, typically they would be zero or 1% loans. This is music to the ears of the 501c3 people here. Um, loan participations, um, interest rate, loan record rates are so good we had it twice. Um, loan guarantees, deposits, community development banks, even leases, and most important, perhaps equity investments which raises a question among those of you with 501c3s, because you know 501c3s don't have owners. So if charities can't have owners, how can they have equity investments? We'll see. These are some of the PRIs that my firm has put together over the years. And um, most of these have nothing at all to do with the L3C, because this has been going on for four decades plus. And in some cases, we represent the funder. And in some cases, we represent the uh, charity or social purpose business recipient. But to give you some sense of the um, diversity of program-related investing, uh, it is essentially any earned revenue activity. Why earned revenue? Without earned revenue, you don't have the capacity to meet your obligations back to the investor, regardless of how the security may be shaped. But on the other hand, many of these may not generate a lot of money. Some do. We'll get to that too. And uh, as unemployment is moving tragically from cyclical unemployment toward structural unemployment, many of these kinds of initiatives are probably more important than ever. Now, um, in uh, 1972, the uh, Internal Revenue Service issued examples, which is a term of art, uh, which describe certain fact patterns that the IRS would recognize as suitable for program-related investment funding. And since 1972, lawyers who have rendered opinions about PRIs have relied on those examples from 1972 uh, or by analogy from those examples, or relied on case law or regulations that were born of that original bundle of examples. So last year, 
the American Bar Association section of taxation uh, issued comments, also a, defendant, a term of art, to the Commissioner of Internal Revenue suggesting, hey, you know, we haven't had any new examples since 1972, and the world has changed. Uh, we have a global community, we have technology, we have organic farming, we have terrorism, we have all kinds of stuff that gives rise to needs which could be solved through social enterprise. And we would like the Internal Revenue Service to recognize that and expand the examples that are sanctioned by the IRS. So these are some of the examples that are um, now in the IRS's hands. I can tell you none of these are controversial because in each and every case I can point to a regulation, an earlier example, a case that if you put them together, get to this place anyway. I would, as an attorney drafting opinions of counsel to foundations and social enterprises and charities, I would have no problem opining that today, under current law, all of these and many more activities are permissible for PRI funding. Interestingly, you'll see some of these are foreign activities. Um, there is a specific um, uh, regulation, internal revenue regulation, that says if an activity is charitable when performed in the United States, it is ipso facto charitable when performed outside the U.S. To have a specific statute to export social impact outside the U.S. So many social enterprises today, many that we're working with, are knowledge-based businesses where we're seeking to define their intellectual property expansively, protect it, nurture it, grow it, and then leverage it through a variety of techniques um, social enterprise franchising, strategic alliances with other social enterprises or nonprofits or NGOs, and often these become global operations or multinational operations, and the law specifically sanctions that. But PRIs, as great as that story just was, have largely been ignored by foundations. Something like 1% of foundations have actually made a program related investment. Mm. And there are a lot of reasons why that is. I've identified a few of them. Um, no process to guarantee that an investment complies. Well, uh, you can get a private letter ruling, uh, cost you about 20,000 bucks in a user fee, plus your legal fee, plus it's adversarial. The, the people who will review your petition are lawyers who will look to the foundation as the taxpayer because if this isn't a PRI, it's subject to that jeopardy assessment tax I mentioned. So, and the burden is always on the taxpayer, so therefore it's an adversarial relationship. It takes uh, 18 months, by which time the entrepreneurial opportunity likely will have evaporated. Plus, if a foundation seeks that comfort, and another foundation wants to become part of a consortium investing in a charity and it wants the same comfort, it can't rely on what the first foundation got as a ruling. Ruling only is relied, can only be relied upon by the uh, petitioner. Um, so you might have six or eight or ten private letter ruling requests floating at once. Not a great system. And um, so for that reason, um, most PRIs are done either by very large foundations who have uh, legal staff internally. Uh, about a year and a half ago, Gates established a pilot project with $400 million, that's chump change for them, um, to recognizing this very leverage argument that I'm describing, the multiplier effect, saying, hey, we don't want to just do grants, we need to put money out in a way that's going to attract other money. I'll show you how that works. But um, also, it allowed them to get money back and put it out once again. So, either it's going to be a large foundation that does this in my neck of the woods. MacArthur does a lot of these. Kaufman is represented here in this room. I think they do a lot of these. Uh, Kellogg does a lot of these. Uh, others do. Or there are smaller foundations where there is not the um, resist resistance to new ideas that you might find, and there isn't the bureaucratic apparatus that requires 
you know, lots of layers of decision making, and often these foundations will rely on opinions of counsel, which is perfectly fine. And in fact, the law says that if there is an opinion of counsel that cogently makes the case that it's a program-related investment, that in itself demonstrates that the foundation um, exercised uh, its legal obligation to ensure that this is a PRI, and that will inoculate the foundation from the Jeopardy assessment tax. So the, we do a lot of these uh, uh, opinions of counsel in lieu of, and, and, and the other thing is many of these are, are black and white. You can see, yeah, this is clearly charitable. And there's some that aren't so uh, black and white, and then we, we issue an opinion. And they, they can rely on that, and that inoculates them. Sir, yes. Uh, what is the opinion of counsel in lieu of? Is it in lieu of getting the letter from the IRS? It, uh, repeat the question. It is, it, yeah, the question I'm to repeat. The question is, is an opinion of counsel in lieu of securing a private letter ruling from the Internal Revenue Service? <clears throat> they serve the same function in that uh, they give comfort to the foundation that the proposed investment will qualify as a program-related investment. The distinction is when the Internal Revenue Service issues um, a, a ruling, that is dispositive. When I write a letter, it's a letter. Uh, so the, it may or may not give them adequate comfort. In most cases, it does. But unfortunately, I don't have the uh, force of the United States government in my, in my computer. <laughs> not yet. So the, here's where the low-profit limited liability company comes in. And I want to show you how this works. Tell me what our timing is, more or less. So here until 7.30. Okay, so if I get done in a half hour or so? Yeah, okay, appreciate that. So the low profit limited liability company, I did not name it, by the way, and I don't like the name. I am an unabashed capitalist, one with a conscience, but nevertheless a capitalist. Um, it is a, 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 an LLC, a limited liability company, how many here know what a limited liability company is? Most. Okay, good. It is a, a non-corporate form, and it's one that's been around for 25 years in all states, and it shields owners from the debts of the enterprise, much like a corporation would. It has a little greater flexibility than a corporation in terms of governance. It has a little greater tax flexibility than a corporation in terms of tax planning. Um, and it is no accident that the limited liability company was is the base of an L3C. Indeed, in every state where the L3C has been enacted, and that's been accomplished through a friendly amendment to the pre-existing LLC Act. So the L3C inherits all the case law, all the statutory considerations that are not otherwise inconsistent with its very language. So you're not starting with a clean slate in terms of what a judge might say about the obligations of a manager or the rights of a, of a member. So it's an LLC, that's the first thing. But it's a special kind of LLC. And it's special in that often, not always, often, it will have one or more for-profit uh, for members, member, think shareholder or partner, and one or more non-profit members. Uh, and this will give us the ability to bring in different kinds of stakeholders, which is what I promise this form does. That is, entice the for-profit sector. It will have charitable or educational purposes, because PRIs require that we will. It would not have been formed except to accomplish those purposes. And no significant purpose is to produce income or property appreciation. This should all sound familiar now. Interestingly, there is no cap on earnings, nor is there a cap on capital appreciation. And many of these things are already becoming profitable. Uh, it's the value proposition going in that's relevant, looking at the economics as forecasted that's relevant, rather than how it actually comes out. Because nobody knows if a business is going to be successful or unsuccessful the day they make an investment, and it's the day they make the investment that this gets evaluated and no political or legislative purpose. So essentially, it's an LLC whose articles of organization, think charter, and operating agreements, think bylaws, are constrained such that it can only do those things 
that are okay for program-related investments. And it must do those things that a program-related investment must do. Now, the L3C's promise. It will shift the economic risk to third parties. If you have a 501c3, you want to set up uh, uh, an earned revenue venture uh, in furtherance of mission, where the profits are going to go to be deployed programmatically, and you don't have the capital, or you don't want to risk the capital, this is a device that allows you to let other people do the heavy lifting. Financial self-sufficiency. This allows the venture to become self-reliant based upon its own earnings and its own capital. Effective leveraging, I'll show you how that works. Capital flow goes to a double bottom line, sometimes triple. And it's a win-win for everybody who plays this. And that's really, that's one of the um, kind of frosting on the cake here. This is often described as a capital formation or tax-driven platform. But from a governor's perspective, I can tell you it's golden. I'll tell you why. I've set up many companies over the years. And when you have the principles of a company that is to be launched get together, the conversation turns around two variables, money and power. How is the pie going to be split up? What's the compensation going to look like? And what rights do I have? Can I veto you? Do we need a supermajority on that? Here, you have an overarching charitable mission. Everybody understands that. It's mandated by law. And yet, you will see everybody gets the benefit of their bargain in terms of social return, financial return, or both. And therefore, the conversation at the front end of the launch will be respectful of what everybody else in the room is doing and work collaboratively to ensure that everybody gets the benefit of his bargain. Very unusual dynamic and an exceptionally positive one in my view. So I'm going to give you an example of how one of these things looks. I'm going to give you two examples of how one of these things looks. Um, these are made up. The numbers are plug-in numbers. It's purely schematic. So um, this horizontal axis is social return. The vertical axis is financial return. In this example, um, the foundation comes in and is bargaining for a 1% return. Why? Because it wants only a little bit of financial return and lots of social return. It's funding social impact. It's getting the benefit of its bargain. But what else it's doing is, it's shoring up the balance sheet of a new company. It is creating capital in a new company that didn't have any capital before the foundation got into it. Therefore, we can bring in another investor now who is looking for a mix. In my example, a socially conscious individual who says, I like what you're doing. I want to help the cause. I'm willing to forego the return that otherwise I might have earned on a similarly speculative investment, but I need to get something. So it's a blended objective. And here we give it to them. And you see some of each. So this example is incurring a lower financial risk. Why? We don't have this capital sitting at the bottom of the pyramid. And he's, in this example, getting a 3% financial return. And then, because the money came in as it did in the first two layers or tiers or tranches, we now can get a market-driven investor who doesn't give beans about the social impact, wants to get a return on investment, period. And now this investment isn't looking quite as speculative as it did originally. Because now we got lots of cash in the till. He says, "Okay, I'll take six percent. I don't. I wish you guys well. I hope you achieve your social impact. That's not what I'm in it for. And we're giving him six percent for a venture that's going to have modest financial returns, but the prospect of significant social returns. In this example, we have a blended rate of return of four percent. 
Now, you cannot get a private investor looking at this purely on the basis of money to invest for 4% return on a speculative startup that's primarily after charitable uh, good. Couldn't do it. The foundation is the catalyst to make that all happen. And it's all because of that program-related investment obligation that came in the form of the 1969 Tax Reform Act. I'll give you another example, also made up, although this one is a little more based on that. Uh, here, we have a development agency that makes grants. This, uh, we did one here in the state of Maine that worked this way. The government came in with cash. Well, what's the return on the, the uh, financial return on a, on, a, on a development grant or any grant? Zero. Okay? So it's all social return. It's all social return. But now we have a capital tranche. The foundation now came in at the second tier, said, okay, give us 2%. That's about as high as they go. It's either going to be a very low yielding coupon or a disproportionately low equity stake or some combination of it. 2% high social return. That's why they're in it. And now an outside investor in this case can earn 7%. All, right, all of a sudden, you can get lots of people to invest 7%, especially when uh, a CD today is paying you one or two. Coincidentally or not so, 4% did the same job. Um, conflict of interest. The L3C requires that the venture not be intended to generate significant income or appreciation. Yet, every one of the 50 states requires, by law, through the so-called shareholder privacy rule, that managers of companies, boards of directors of corporations, managing partners of partnerships, trustees of business trusts, managers of limited liability companies, must, as fiduciaries, make decisions that drive financial value for owners. How do you reconcile this? Figure we must be able to, right? Or else I wouldn't bring it up. Solutions. Reliance on the applicable constituency statute, I'm going to show you what that is in a minute, also known as a stakeholder statute, and expenditure responsibility, which is a tax concept. Here is the great state of Texas's um, constituency statute. And it says directors may consider the long-term and short-term interests of the corporation and the shareholders of the corporation when making decisions. This is intended to inoculate management from making decisions that are not necessarily um, in the immediate financial interest of corporation of, of uh, shareholders. It's a weak statute, and it's primarily intended to deal with hostile takeover situations. Uh, the Ben and Jerry situation is one that people talk about, where an unsolicited offer for the company came in, they were going to uh, move all employees offshore to sweatshops, they were going to shut down all the economic development where the business was located, and management felt they'd have no alternative but to accept the offer because it had a, it was, a it was an irresistible financial deal for shareholders. And the intent here is something like that. Uh, considering the best interest of the corporation may consider long-term and short-term interests. I don't know what that means, but I can tell you, if I were on the opposite side of that case, I'd win. Give you an example of what other constituency statutes look like. This is from my home state of Illinois. Uh, board of directors and officers may consider the effects of any action, including without limitation any action which may involve or relate to a change of potential change of control of the corporation, example I just gave you, but any effects of any action upon employees, suppliers, customers, communities, and all other pertinent factors. So it gives wide berth to management to make decisions where they're not going to be stung for making a decision that may not necessarily grow value for shareholders. Now the counter argument is all these things do drive value for shareholders. That's a different conversation. But, um, and I don't have time for it, unless there are questions. The other uh, way of reconciling these seemingly irreconcilable standards of, on the one hand, driving financial value for shareholders, and on the other hand, 
um, not building uh, income or appreciation, is the tax law. The tax law requires for a PRI, um, the foundation must require that the manager of the L3C contractually undertake to use the money only for the agreed purpose, provide annual financial reporting, have books and records reasonably available, and not support propaganda, candidates, campaigns, and so on. So contractually now, the company is taking on a, an independent duty to the foundation, uh, separate and apart from its fiduciary obligation to owners. Uh, optimal venture, socially beneficial, even nearer, charitable. Consistent cash flow, um, doesn't have to be a lot of cash flow. It has to be fairly predictable so that the entity and its planning can gain comfort that there'll be enough cash in the hopper to meet obligations to investors, as modest as those obligations may be. And entrepreneurial, by definition, these are our startup situations. About half of those we're putting together, I'm sure we do more of these than any law firm in the country, uh, are subsidiaries or affiliates of pre-existing 501c3s or being created in tandem with de novo 501c3s. The theory here is the C3 attracts tax-deductible contributions from individuals, corporations, as well as grants. The L3C can receive grants as well, asterisk, but also can peddle debt or equity or both. So what happens is you've uh, tapped into essentially every kind of funding source. And then if you look at the uh, 501c3 and the L3C as one economic unit, and they could be shaped this way, you can move money around the system as and when needed fairly seamlessly. And then the other the others are standalone for profit social purpose businesses. Um, we are seeing uh, lots of opportunity for creativity in designing L3Cs, lots of different uses. Um, I mentioned the first for social venture seeking to secure PRI support from foundations that forego market rate returns and thus subsidize private sector investors who can thereby earn market rate returns or a single purpose, wholly owned subsidiaries of tax exempt um, organizations. We see lots of reasons to do that. For ventures that seek to draw consumer and funder attention to their status as social enterprises, this is the branding uh, feature. And for coalitions of nonprofits that join forces to tackle a social problem through the application of business principles. So they may have shared infrastructure, shared computers, shared administrative, functions and of, to the extent that's capital intensive, like computer stuff or software development, one, they share the expense, two, they then shift it to a third party to fund it. And yet it is income generating because then they license those rights to the respective 501c3s. Cash comes in, the obligations are satisfied to the third parties, but the need gets done charitably. Uh, we also do this with intellectual property, where we'll dump that into an L3C and, and license it back to the parents. Uh, getting royalties, the royalties that are used to uh, uh, meet obligations to investors. Uh, there is a proposed statute uh, which would improve the um, federal statute, that is, which would improve this uh, private letter ruling situation. It would allow uh, the L3C, not the foundation, the L3C or another social enterprise to apply in a very expedited and simplified way, the form is two pages, um, voluntary, if you are blessed by the IRS, and it doesn't go to the lawyers anymore, it goes to the people who look at 1023s, which I call super clerks, and very affectionately. Um, so it's not adversarial. And if they approve your filing, um, then any number of foundations get to rely on it. They don't have to do their own, and it has the same force of law as if it were a private letter ruling. Um, the the, the trade-off is, and I kind of like this, annual reporting on both financial and social outcomes. So we'll see where that goes. Congress, as I understand, is preoccupied with some other things. I don't know what it is. Um, this is where we are with L3C legislation right now. Uh, nine states, Rhode Island says 2012 because their law was signed, but it takes effect next year. I don't see Texas on there, sir. However, I should tell you, uh, you have the ability to organize an L3C in any state and then register it as a foreign entity in your home state. So you can have 
And there are, in fact, I know because I represent them, there are Texas L3Cs. And um, the only thing you really lose by that is um, there is an exemption under the securities laws for certain issues based upon selling securities to people in a given state where the company is also uh, domiciled. So if you're raising money from the public, not everybody does this, um, it would be nice to have a home state L3C to take advantage of that exemption. Even without that exemption, there are lots of other ways to get securities law exemptions. So not the end of the world. I'm going to move along. Benefit corporations and other kind of entity creating a public benefit. Um, here the deal is, this again is a new form of entity for an entirely different purpose but for a social enterprise. Can be a subsidiary of a charity, can be standalone. Um, this is a corporation, not an LLC. And it's a corporation that is um, within its charter and by law must create a material positive impact in society and the environment. Impact must be measured by a third party annually. And then a benefit report must be published. Those are the requirements. The benefit corporation's benefits, if you do all that, is directors are immune from liability under the very precept that I described earlier, the shareholder primacy doctrine. So long as the directors are acting in the reasonable performance of their duties. Uh, this again is a loophole large enough for even a medium sized dump truck to drive through. <laughs> no uh, lack of policing. These are some concerns I have about this. And there are concerns about the L3C, which we should talk about as well. But uh, the vetting thing, you can forum shop. You can go find in a third party agency and you don't like the first one's report, well, let's go find another one. Uh, so it doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, litigation risk may shift from shareholder claims that the board is not maximizing profit to shareholder claims that the board is not sufficiently pursuing the corporation's general or specific public benefit. I've talked to the lawyer who wrote the first bill on this, and he agrees with me uh, as to both of these issues. He thinks it's not. This doesn't work so well with public companies. Uh, I don't know that the risk is real great that you're going to have a shareholder derivative suit at a private company. So it seems to me that it's a misdirection. Uh, one solution would be that in order for any shareholder to sue, there should be some threshold number of shares he or she must own. So you can't just get, have an activist buy one share and say, okay, well, you're doing great on the social justice stuff, but you're screwing up the environment. And now all of a sudden you're, you're, you're getting financial relief for an entity because it does, doesn't doing enough in every single area. So I think there are, there's work to be done on this. Still, there are good things about it. Uh, most early adopters are more interested in branding than derivative lawsuit protection anyway. Um, Benefit Corporation codifies the entrepreneur's social and environmental ethos and it offers legal recognition of the venture's core values. The thing that's uh, omitted here, and it struck me as a fairly peculiar omission, is none of the benefit corporation laws require that the name of the corporation in any way signal that this is a benefit corporation. So L every L3C must have L3C in its name. So you know, if you want to use it for branding, oh, yeah. you shouldn't use it only for branding, but many do. Um, it's L3C, it's there, it's clear. And consumers understand it, funders understand it, or increasingly will. Here, the benefit corporation, you could use ABC Corporation, and you are a benefit corporation, so independently, you need to promote the fact that you're a benefit corporation. The name doesn't telegraph the, uh, the, the, the fact that you're a social enterprise. Um, benefit corporation legislation, I have two footnotes, count them. Um, there are four technical benefit corporation states now Maryland, in addition to having a benefit corporation, just followed suit and has a benefit LLC. When, I don't say if, but when Maryland also has an L3C law, it could have a benefit L3C, therefore. Um, doesn't yet. Uh, the other thing is, just this week, Hawaii um, presented to its governor a bill that was passed by the Hawaiian legislature for a sustainable business corporation, which with a few bells and whistles is very similar to, but not identical to, a benefit corporation. 
the governor has until July 12th to either sign it, making it law, or not sign it, making it law. This is political. So we have you know, five states, essentially, that have this concept in play. Lots of others are working through it as well. Pay for success bonds, this is the last thing I'm going to talk about, I think. Uh, also known as social impact bonds. This is something pretty exciting. Um, this is not an entity form at all, but a way of getting those impact investors that I talked about. I should mention, just to kind of round the, the circle here, I mentioned I would talk about each kind of investment. Uh, and I don't think I talked about socially responsible investments, except I mentioned a socially conscious individual. Let me, that I think is cheating a little bit. Let me tell you about where a socially conscious, uh, where a, 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 a portfolio comes into play within the L3C. Um, so often we're finding the foundation comes in at the first tranche with a PRI. It in fact becomes a social venture capitalist. Because so often, given the history I've described, foundations were created by baby boomers who grew up in the 60s, were on the forefront of the women's movement, the gay and lesbian movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement, the Green Movement. They had the activism in their genes. Now they got money and they had this foundation. They sold their business, they got the foundation. So they're eager to roll up their shirt sleeves and get back in the game if you show them that there's a way to do it. Many of them, in fact, would like to get the next generation involved because when you sit around the kitchen table talking about what the grants are going to be, maybe they'll have uh, Peter and Susan sitting there too, and they want to get the kids in on this, uh, and you know, you can actually roll up your shirt sleeves and get to work for this business that has social impact. Oh yeah, I'd love to do that. So, and many of them make introductions and provide expertise and do all kinds of stuff in addition to money. Remember, they have, a, they have an ax to grind. They have a stake in this venture. Well, that being the case, two things are done. Two things we do. One is, we will have a talk with that foundation about, hey, you know, you're really generous to give us that $50,000 or $3 million, but you know, you have to pay this 5% thing every year. And we would never encourage that it be uh, concentrated in any one investment that would be improved. So it's a piece of the 5%. But they have to do it every year. Now they have a, a vested interest in the success of this very venture. So it is not inappropriate, or at least I am sufficiently aggressive to, tell them, could you promise that you'll do it again next year? Okay. They're really just, um, they're, they're doubling down on their investment. They're seeing opportunity here in the first place, so why not, uh, they have to make the distribution anyway, they might as well favor this investment. And I'll ask, what do we do it the year after too? Yeah, okay, we can do it for three years, five years, whatever, I can get out of them. And then we will securitize that promise. We'll discount it to present value, we'll cash it out of the bank. So in year one, on day one, you'll have essentially three or five years worth of contributions as that first capital tranche. So that's one thing we might do. The other thing we might do is say, when you get up to the higher tranches, um, pretty soon this investment now becomes a pretty attractive investment. It's got a strong balance sheet, it's got a great social purpose, it's making some money, not a lot, but it's making money, it's paying its bills, no reason you cannot talk to that foundation about making a mission-related investment at a higher tranche with greater security and greater yield. Because it's got that 95% that it hasn't distributed out, and it's got to invest it in a diversified way anyway. So if they want to take a piece of that and make an investment of a more secure nature, and we find pretty uh, healthy appetite for doing that. Okay, back to pay for success bonds. Um, the, here's the deal here. I'm going to lay this out because it's really uh, novel. Um, by the way, for those of you who noticed, uh, the speech that President Obama gave before the controversial speech this week, the budget speech actually had $100 million allocated for this very concept. And states are picking up on it too. So this is real, but it's new and innovative. It aligns the interests of government agencies, private investors, and nonprofits around specific social outcomes. Leverages private investment capital to pay for early intervention programs delivered by service providers, maybe nonprofits, typically are. Government pays financial returns to investors if and when improved social outcomes are achieved. If the outcomes don't improve, investors lose their money. <coughs> if outcomes are achieved, 
government returns principal plus specified return, which can be high. And the idea is, this is a futures market on social outcomes. Hmm. The first one uh, took effect October of last year. First one in the world. Happened to be in the UK. Happened to be funded by Rockefeller and some others. Is an impact investment. Of 40,200 adults serving short-term criminal sentences, 60% were expected to reoffend within one year at great cost to society and taxpayers. Concerned about recidivism. In October 2010, Rockefeller and others invested five million pounds in bonds to fund counseling, employment, housing, and other support services for recently released prisoners in an effort to reduce the recidivism rate. And here's the business deal. If reoffending is reduced by 7.5% or more, investors will receive payments from the UK government reflecting a share of its long-term savings. Government's trying to find ways to reduce costs on social programs. This shifts the burden of the private sector in exchange for participation in the rewards of innovation. If not, investors lose their money. The uh, first step in this direction in the U.S. was a misstep. Minnesota has had introduced a Pay for Performance Act of 2011. It was actually a section of their omnibus appropriations bill, which ultimately got vetoed by the government for grounds other than this. Uh, so it was, they tried to sneak it into a bigger bill and they got, they didn't get a good result. Now, that's not to suggest this will not be reintroduced, but right now it's nowhere. But let me just show you how it would have worked had it been passed. And interestingly, the legislature passed this. It's the governor who vetoed it on really appropriations grounds rather than any, anything to do with this specifically. Act would have established a $20 million pilot program. State would have contracted with pre-qualified providers. Funds would have come from a special appropriation bond issue in the municipal market. And providers would have been paid only if the state's return on investment was positive. Okay, that's Minnesota. Massachusetts is moving forward. Massachusetts issued a request for information on May 6th, and here's what they asked for. They wanted to get all interested parties to tell them what kinds of intervention programs might be funded by this uh, kind of a bond. And uh, what social service is most promising for this, what innovative solutions might be the ones to support, uh, area of targeted investments that most likely reduce budget costs, um, and so on. That was the ask. Responses came in June 10. Next step is they're going to issue a request for response, meaning they will have identified which ones they want to go for, and it's essentially um, an RFP at this point. So we're moving ahead. Okay, right on the dime. Um, so thank you for your attention. There may be a question or two, I'm not sure. What's the social impact bonds? Does it tend to be foundations and mission related? Well, the tend to be, understand, the first one ever in the world was last September. So the, I am actually working with some nonprofits to issue their own and um, to give variable returns on bonds based upon of uh, their innovation in attacking specific social problems. And the way it's going to work, you may say, well, where's that coming from? Um, to the extent there is a savings in the way they had been doing it, now that creates some cash. Further, this becomes a very attractive way to bring philanthropy back into the social enterprise picture and tell them, hey, look, we would like you to fund um, bonus payments to those social entrepreneurs who are able to attack our problems more cost effectively. And if you talk about social metrics, which is something I have to be very strongly about, this is a, it's a pretty cool way of doing that. So it could be a collaboration between the charity and its philanthropists, its donors, in supporting innovation by third party service providers, whether for profit, like an L3C or benefit corporation, or by a nonprofit itself. 
So there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on in this area, and I think over the course of the next year or two years, you're going to see enormous uh, movement in this space because it is a private sector solution at the very time that's exactly what we need. But there must be state enabled legislation. No, not not what I'm doing. I'm doing it based. It's, it's contractual. Uh, this is state because the state is funding it out of state savings. But if the, if the nonprofit has its own mission and it wants to find cheaper and better ways to get the job done, uh, it can reach out to other kinds of social enterprises or other nonprofits and do joint ventures along these lines where the compensation is essentially contingent on results. So there's a lot of, a lot of ways of, of, of uh, engineering this kind of a strategy. Yes, sir. Uh, Clayton Christensen's research on disruptive innovation. Yes. Uh, in there, he talks about how uh, most large organizations are not set up to be able to effectively do disruptive innovation, right? And, uh, and so the notion of skunk works are spinning off smaller pieces uh, of the organization to address smaller and developing markets with lower profits is one of the things that he advocates. It sounds like there could be a fit between this and uh, uh, this, this for, these well, organizational yeah. forms and what Christensen's talking about. The, yeah, the, I don't know that I'm able to repeat that whole question. Uh, <laughs> maybe my answer will give a clue as to what the question right. was for those who aren't here. What you're describing, uh, I think, is, is uh, right on the money. Okay. Uh, and in, in still another respect, and that has to do, I know that this uh, audience consists largely of nonprofit folks, so I will, I'm going to say a little heresy here. Um, there is a culture clash between nonprofit and for profits environments. And uh, often when we take a um, nonprofit and introduce a for profit subsidiary affiliate, uh, there is uh, um, there may be some resistance mm -hmm. to the very feature that may be most attractive about doing this, namely holding the venture to commercially reasonable standards, bringing in experienced business people, relying less on volunteerism, mm -hmm. uh, having uh, real metrics, financial and social in this case. So that stuff can often be done that stuff often needs to be done in a way that I'll describe as experimentally. Uh, uh, major, although we're working with a number of very large nonprofits around the country in, in this very kind of stuff. And there's enormous appetite for it, just enormous appetite. But some of the smaller charities um, are resistant to change, as all of us are as human beings. And uh, there is a sometimes a bureaucratic roadblock associated with buy-in. So, yeah, I mean, you, this has to be positioned in a way where all of um, um, management, the board, the, the leadership team understands what this is, what this is not, and what it takes to get it done right. And it involves business planning and clean execution by people who know how to do it. Now, that may be you know, that may be uh, foreign territory for some folks, but, the, to, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurial ventures have a very high failure rate to begin with, right. okay? Some may say, well, look, link it up with a charity that's predicated on, you know, a, a different way of doing things. It may have a uh, even a worse failure rate. What I'm seeing is actually the diff a, a different outcome, and I'll tell you why. And it has to do with the role of the foundation or the role of the impact investor these people are not throwing money away. They are seeing to it that things are done right. Now, that may be perceived as an intrusion. In most cases, it's perceived very, as very helpful because they know what they're doing, and it can really guide the nonprofit to get to a much better outcome. Plus, they have deep pockets and sophistication. Uh, so to the extent that capital or lack of capital is a reason that small businesses often fail, that's less a problem here. And to the extent that lack of experience is another big reason, that too may not necessarily be a problem here. So the, like, there's a way to mix and match objectives and value propositions for each stakeholder in a way that the venture's success uh, is um, much more likely. But I think your point about disruptive change is, is very 
is very appropriate. Now, another aspect of innovation is that oftentimes innovation doesn't generate cash flow immediately. And you said earlier that one of the criteria for PRI is to have a predictable cash Let's flow. Let's talk about that. Yeah. That's Thank you. Um, as you may know, many foundations are disinclined to make a grant unless the grant is attached to a specific program. Many foundations, not as a matter of law, but as a matter of policy or custom and practice, many foundations are disinclined to fund proof of concept. Mm -hmm. Many foundations are disinclined to, improve, to fund capacity building. Yeah. Not so with the L3C. Because if the foundation, number one, there's no legal prohibition uh, against it, but more significant, um, they could be along for the ride. And as any equity investor would, they understand the payoffs down the road. Mm -hmm. and so it more closely aligns not only the objectives, but the expectations of the parties in a way that, uh, that um, grant-making organizations and nonprofits typically do not collaborate mm -hmm. because of the foundation, not because of the charity. Yes? Um, I need some clarification on what your recommendations are for startup concepts that are ready to do the proof of concept and actually the fundraising piece. What, how, do, how does a unfunded great idea get itself to a place that actually you can actively go after this kind of structure? In what context? Are you speaking on behalf of a nonprofit? I, a nonprofit that also will have a for profit piece to it. It will, but it doesn't currently, is that your point? That's correct. So you're you're asking how do you go about pre planning for the eventual launch launch of a for profit subsidiary? And and, and identifying the funding that it's gonna to take to pay for the legal structure that it sounds like this you know, that's part of it. How do you identify it or how do you pay for it? Pay for it. Ah. Um, it's an allocation of resources. Uh, just like anything else, and it has to. It, so long as the as the nonprofit it does um, planning as it should periodically, uh, this can be a part of that planning exercise. Uh, sometimes donors uh, who themselves may be entrepreneurial will be supportive of uh, an evaluation and investigation of the nonprofit suitability for a social enterprise. Not all nonprofits are candidates. Not all should be doing this, um, but those that should, this can be golden. So there is, and it's a relatively inexpensive, you know, we're talking about sometimes a feasibility study, sometimes it's uh, internal, you know, kind of a quasi-focus group, I and mean, there are different ways of playing that out, uh, which don't need to be terribly expensive in most cases. But the answer is no different from any other startup. Uh, the startup, if the, if the idea is deemed uh, sufficiently meritorious to go on to the next step, then it's sufficiently meritorious to warrant the funding to take the next step. That's a business judgment by management. And then seek the funding to make that happen based upon having developed, it made the case internally first and then externally. Yes, sir. What's your experience with, uh, this is kind of a two part, with foundations going to get directly involved once they make that initial or subsequent um, contribution and specifically are they oftentimes seeking a seat on the board? And the second question is we've had some experience where foundations um, recognize that it created a conflict of interest to accept a seat on the board even though they might have wanted it to begin with. They received some counsel that subsequent contribution would then not be possible. Yeah. There is, uh, uh, first of all, there is um, a tax rule that prohibits what's called excess business holdings <clears throat> by a foundation. And uh, the, the, the basic rule is that the foundation can't own more than 20% of a venture. Uh, there are circumstances under which it can be expanded to a larger number, typically 35%. So further, there are private benefit and private inurement rules <clears throat> that require that the charity uh, control the sub, if it's a sub, lest the third party piggyback the tax exemption of the charity for its own benefits. 
So you're exactly right. There are governance, fiduciary, and tax rules that all coalesce to raise issues, all of which can be overcome. However, as to each of which, the, all of the participants need to be sensitized. Uh, as to your first question, would uh, how active? It's widely variable. And it is dependent largely uh, on, one, the size of the investment relative to the corpus of the foundation. Two, the foundation management's sense of how expert and competent the management of this new venture is. Do they need to complement or, or, or supplement <coughs> that management? And three, how nervous they are. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, sometimes they will seek board seats. Sometimes they will get board seats, and then there are ways to um, mitigate the risk associated with conflicts that are thereby created, often through recusal, which is a simple way of doing it. Uh, but um, both very good questions, and the answers are kind of predicated on the facts and circumstances of the relationship. Would you explain again the difference between mission-related investment and program-related investment? Yeah. Um, Program-related investment is a, is a technical tax term. Mission-related mm -hmm. investment is a term in the common parlance. So it doesn't have as technical a definition. But a, a mission-related investment is intended to be an investment out of an institution's portfolio that delivers both financial and social returns. And it's called mission-related because the social return is itself driving its mission. Okay. But it's nothing more technical, fancy, or sophisticated than that. The program-related investment is the one that I've described to you that has to be speculative without an expectation of making a lot of money or appreciating assets for charitable purposes. It also must be program-related in that the venture must have as its purpose um, a charitable or similar uh, objective that is the same as or compatible with the program and the foundation, hence the name. But that's the one we've mostly been talking about, that's program, and that's, that's the tax concept that's born in the Tax Reform Act of 69. Um, all this stuff is gaining traction. I think there are missteps being made. Um, I think those missteps will be uncomfortable for some folks. I think some uh, L3Cs are being organized that shouldn't be. I think there are people pushing L3C as advocates, saying there should be as many as we can have. And I think that's absolutely the wrong thing to do with a new and therefore fragile structure. So I think there's going to be some ill will consequently. The benefit corporation, I do not think, will serve its intended purpose. Um, yet, it sensitizes the world to, hey, there is this thing called social enterprise. There is this convergence of for-profit and non-profit. There is this thing called shared value. There is this thing called introduction of uh, core values within the DNA of a business structure. All that's critically important, and that's not going away. Uh, and more and more are businesses embracing social concepts, not cause-related marketing, but light years beyond that. Mm. And I think that will continue to take hold. It grows brand equity for business companies. It attracts and retains good employees. It uh, sends a signal to customers and funders that these are good people of integrity. There's lots of good stuff that happens from it, selfishly. And the important thing is that everybody's got to act from their own self-interest. A nonprofit acting out of its own self-interest is pursuing its mission as impactfully and cost-effectively as it can. That's great. A business, similarly, must make money, no profit, no mission. Uh, and it's got to do so in a way where it's a good corporate citizen and all that stuff sounds hackneyed now. But it's taking on a new dimension and a new depth and a new seriousness. Uh, you know, the Harvard uh, Business Review uh, articles about shared value are legit. The, too often, it's preaching to the choir. Well, the choir is growing. And Social Enterprise Alliance and other organizations, Net Impact, 
and many others I can identify, are all comrades in arms here because the truth is government can't get the job done. Philanthropy can't get the job done. Still, too many donors are looking at what is a charity expending an administrative cost and penalizing them if they invest in the future, penalizing them if they invest in staff or computers. It's nuts. Or they don't want to spend money. I had I was working on behalf of a client who was going through a very difficult transition, a nonprofit. And they had a foundation that had historically given them money. And every year they gave them the money attached to a specific program. And the priority this year was rent and payroll. The foundation wouldn't listen to them. I got on the phone, I said, you know, if you don't give them the money for the rent and payroll, there won't be any programs. Well, this is the way we do it. Okay. People are getting this. They're starting to understand this. Uh, Dan Pilat is working on charitable, same idea. Um, and I'm working with a number of states in um, facilitating the formation and funding of social enterprises. Um, I worked with one state who put together a presentation. That, it has now been approved, but I'm not at liberty, but you'll see it soon. And the, the presentation we put together was called Doing More With Less. That's what this is about. It's about leverage. It's about bringing in players who are putting money in other places, and if you could find a way to subsidize their returns, they put money here. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. Found this PRI is one example of this. Guess what? There's lots of other examples, and lots of others are cooked are being cooked. This uh, success bond thing, I would imagine this will take off. Now that too has some controversy attached to it. One of the one of the concerns in the uh, Minnesota bill, I get this. Um, it shifted risk to the to the nonprofits because uh, the nonprofit was a service provider. It didn't get the job done. It may not be its fault. It may just be circumstance, or you know, the solution wasn't what they had hoped it would be. Well, the government penalizes them. Well, this ought to be about incentives and subsidies, not penalties. But they're starting to get that, and as more and more um, thought leaders, uh, centers of influence and decision makers, and they're all different pockets that they reside in, come together, collaborate, and see with one vision, then that vision will take hold and will deliver the results. But certainly, what we're here talking about, what Social Enterprise Alliance is doing, is key to that, to that message and to that progress. What is the alternative? People are, people are dying in the streets. Kids don't have homes. I mean, so if we don't, if we don't pursue private sector solutions that make sense, get the capital, and it's not only capital, it's capital, it's expertise, it's the will to do it, it's the formula to do it right, because sometimes you don't have lots of chances here. You know, you do, it may only be one way to do it right and lots of ways to do it wrong. So getting the right professional talents, getting the right planning underway. I mean, all of this, these are all obvious ingredients when you're talking to business people. Now the social sector is catching up. Yes. Um, I'm going to ask my question kind of in a reverse way here. Is this? If I'll you, answer back. There you go. You, you would do that. <clears throat> the, the hospital was starting. I'm, I'm trying to understand, like let's say for a medical industry. Yes. Um, if a hospital is starting today, would they still go the nonprofit route or the L3C route? Which would, route would be better for them? And the reason why I ask is. I'm looking at opening up a business that is in the medical right. field, but it's not a hospital. Right. And there are both cases. There's nonprofits and then there are for profits. Right. Which route? What? what you asked a hospital specifically. No, it's not a hospital specifically. But your question relates to hospitals. Yeah, I'm, I'm just because it kind of relates. It's like if they were to start a new no, hospital. We'll, we'll today, answer this question as a proxy for the question you really want to ask. Um, <laughs> the, uh, whether you want a for-profit or a non-profit venture turns out variables and you know what they are. Um, where's the money coming from? Is it going to be, are you going to be heavily dependent upon donations and grants? What's the governance? Is this going to be something where you want this as your, your little fiefdom or are you going to be content to have a real board? Um, is there an exit in the future? Is this something where you want to grow personal wealth? 
where you want to eventually have a sale to a successor or a strategic sale to a public company or go public yourself. None of those, all those things can be done with a nonprofit, just not easily. So the, the governance issues, the personal objectives associated with the venture, the sources of funding, those are the primary considerations. So maybe there, often there's a positioning issue where if you're going to be dealing with counterparties who are nonprofits, you may want a nonprofit hat in order to gain credibility or even access. That's another reason why we often have a nonprofit and a for-profit operating in tandem. You can wear the hat that works based upon the audience and the transaction. So I mean, you know, those are the kinds of things. Now, to get down in a more granular fashion to how the questions get answered, that you know, that I can't answer in a general way. But there are there are obviously your steps. To, you know, it's a decision tree, and you get through certain steps in order to arrive at certain conclusions. I don't know if that helped. So to the hospital point, if the hospital was starting up today, what which route would be better? Oh, I think I'd probably stay away from. Uh, Healthcare today. <laughs> I, might, I might recommend a hot dog stand. Um, it's a very tough business to get into because obviously the political climate. Um, but I think that uh, a, a serious answer to your question might be uh, position this thing in a way that's going to be uh, regarded most hospitably by the relevant regulators and decision makers at the governmental level. Increasingly, that's social enterprise. But you know, there are a lot of other there are a lot of other pieces to that puzzle. So I don't want to give you a definitive answer because I don't know anything about your business, but I I will. Yes. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a power. Do you have any indication of how some of these groups like Greg Richards, Skull Foundation, um, Phoebe Kaufman? Um, I've interacted with them in the last four years, but not in the last probably year, and. Um, they sometimes the oversight uh, was so much that it would uh, almost misdirect programs. Is, is it being perhaps received more differently with a lot of these um, types of funding? And where, where would they fall in that sort of funding? I think if you look at their programming, you'll get an insight as to their orientation toward these questions. I'll leave it at that. Circumstance where a nonprofit who goes into a social, who begins a social enterprise and gets the loan, for example, and the enterprise fails, would there ever be a circumstance where the board of directors could be liable for that? Um, I hate to say no because I'm a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> it would be highly unusual. Even the charity would not be liable unless it guarantees the obligation. One of the reasons you use uh, a subsidiary is to isolate the liabilities of the venture away from the charity. So if it's, you know, the typical case, the subsidiary signs off on the note, there's no guarantee, so they didn't even go to the charity, let alone its board. But boards, under most state laws, are insulated from personal liability if they act as volunteers anyway. Uh, and uh, as a belt and suspenders approach, uh, we will always recommend directors and officers liability insurance anyway. So it would be highly unusual. I mean, I, I, I would have difficulty even conjuring up a fact pattern where the charities board would have personal liability. If they had personal liability, I think they concurrently have a malpractice action against corporate counsel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. The uh, pay for success bond seemed interesting and, and timely. Uh, since governments tend to be rather risk averse on new approaches and this gives an opportunity yeah. to construct the possibility to try something out and hopefully a bit of political cover to demonstrate some uh, successful results. Uh, given the financial problems states are having at this point, how much interest are you seeing in these at this point? Uh, and what's your outlook for them? Well, I mean, I've identified two states that already had legislation passed by their legislatures when the concept itself was first implemented uh, only a few months ago worldwide. So that should give you, some, plus the president included this in his state of his uh, budget address. So I, I, my expectation is that there's gonna be some action here. Mark, what do we need to do to put Texas on the map and get our legislators in line? Did I get my card yet? Oh. <laughs> um, What's the next step for, I mean, as a chapter, what can we do to begin that movement. Well, Suzanne actually has the answer to that. Yay! I'm supposed to give my answer. Oh, I'm supposed to give your answer? But I would say it as well as you do. No, no, no. You're the one being 
<laughs> oh, <laughs> then I'd better be careful. Uh, Suzanne, who, as I'm sure you know, is a member of Social Enterprise Alliance's national board, he has been uh, very energetically uh, spearheading a state-by-state -state effort to create awareness at the local governmental level, um, whether it be a task force to look into these issues and come back with recommendations for legislation to both the governor and the legislature and otherwise. And she could speak much more authoritatively about this um, than she does. <laughs> yes. As a reflection of Suzanne's uh, success, for those of us in Texas where uh, the legislature tends to not be so progressive. You're uh, kidding. And we, we won't anticipate <laughs> the, uh, the legislation yeah. being soon. Yeah. Are, are there particular states that we ought to look towards to be forming corporate uh, entities in, instead of others? Thank you. That question allows me to say a couple of things that I should say. Uh, one is, when you're looking at the L3C, or the benefit corporation, or any other emerging form. There are emerging forms. Uh, California's California's having a competition between the L3C and the benefit corp, and they have their flexible purpose corporation Act Two. And in the meantime, they have nothing. Um, but there are other states where things are percolating. What you need to understand is the decision doesn't tie to the four corners of that specific legislation, because if you're selecting a state for the domicile of the business you're buying into its laws. And there are laws that can be particularly supportive of what you want to do in lots of different ways, or, or particularly inimical to what you want to do in lots of different ways. So my suggestion is you get legal counsel to assist you in that decision, because I can't say this bill is better than that bill. I could, but that would miss the point because the decision relates to a, a, a global series of questions that go well beyond that specific legislation. The other thing I wanted to mention, and I should mention, um, we all understand the political environment here. Even I, as a, an interloper, uh, understand the political climate here. And until uh, President Perry takes office, <laughs> um, you may have this kind of a situation for a while. So um, one of the opportunities you do have, in addition to the one you've identified, namely um, selecting a, a platform that works best for you in another state and importing it here, which is absolutely available. We do it every day. In addition to that, there are transactional approaches as distinguished from entity approaches, which can get you to largely the same place for most purposes. Now, for example, um, one of the grounds upon which the L3C is criticized, and there are several, is it's redundant. You don't need it. You can use an LLC. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. I can take an LLC, a Texas LLC, doctor it up so it's articles of organization, read the same, absolutely permit it. You won't get the L3C. Well, yeah, you can even put the L3C in the name. You're not going to have it the way it would look in most LPCs, but there's no prohibition against using those, those, those two letters and one number in the name if you wanted to. Maybe, maybe the Attorney General is saying it's misleading. I don't know. So let me withdraw it. I don't know. But, uh, but you can have that. Now, what the L3C does that, that won't get you is um, the ability to be perceived by the world as an L3C. You're an LLC. And foundations, therefore, won't have a neat wrapper to invest in where they know, hey, this entity, by law, imposes a fiduciary obligation on management to run the thing to, uh, uh, in a way that's acceptable for PRIs. And consumers won't say, hey, I know this is a, a social enterprise. I mean, but that doesn't preclude you from, from getting a PRI. You know, maybe there are other steps or other, but again, it's available to you. Um, similarly, there are things we can do in terms of mitigating the risk of shareholder primacy where it even is an issue. Most of these aren't public companies. Often I'll draft these things to allow them to morph into public companies. I tell you, that works. Because, you know, once in a while you find a nugget of gold and it turns that way. But um, most of these are not public companies or not starting out that way. 
And you can put disclosures within offering materials to investors, putting them on notice as to how the company is going to be managed and contractually having them waive certain rights. So, I mean, there are ways of approximating some of this stuff. Maybe it's not as clean, maybe it's not as easy, maybe it requires a little more uh, tender, loving care from counsel, but these things are available. Similarly, I already mentioned the social impact bond, the pay for success bond. I'm already doing these privately. I'm not waiting for government. Today, we don't have any state that uh, specifically authorizes it, but there's no prohibition against the charity approximating that same kind of a business proposition um, transactionally. And if it has merit, it has merit whether or not there's a law behind it. I mean, you can draft a bond and the bond can have contingent returns and you can supplement bonus returns through philanthropy or other resources, particularly if you're saving money programmatically because the innovation works. And if the innovation doesn't work, it's not going to cost you. So, I mean, it seems to be a lot of ways to, I don't, I don't want to bemoan the political climate on this particular issue. I have some other misgivings about uh, your fair state. But um, it seems to me there are ways of approximating similar results and similar opportunities, both public and private. Two minutes, I'm done. At least anyone has another question. Any other questions? Thank you all. I very much enjoyed it.